I'm Mike Scherzlick, and I'm the founder of the Holy Family School of Faith, which we established with Archbishop Joseph Nauman of Kansas City in Kansas in 2005 to teach and form people in the Catholic faith, especially to form those who form others. Now, you might not think that you are involved in formation of others, but if you're a grandparent or a parent or a catechist or a Catholic school teacher or a deacon or a priest or just someone interested in learning more about the Catholic faith and what the Catholic Church teaches, then this journey through the catechism is just for you. Just for you. But let's start by entrusting this session and our whole journey, this pilgrimage through the catechism, by entrusting it to Our Lady. And so we begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Why should we study the Catechism of the Catholic Church? There is an important ingredient in the life of John Paul II that allows us to see really why we should study the Catechism. Pope John Paul II was beatified May 1st of 2011. But there's one thing that you may not know about the life of John Paul II. Before John Paul, young Carol Wojtyla, before Carol Wojtyla was 21 years old, before he was 21, his mother, his father, his sister, and his brother were all dead. And he was left with no family in the world. And his country, Poland, was plunged into the midst of World War II and all of the horrors of the Nazi occupation. This could have been a moment of great fear and paralysis for John Paul, young Carol Wojtyla. But God was with him, and God provided for him in a very wonderful way. God put young John Paul II, Carol Wojtyla, in touch with a man named Jan Tiranowski, who was a member of his parish. John Paul's parish at that point in Krakow was St. Stanislaw. And his parish, St. Stanislaw, was run by a religious order, the Salesians. But one of the first things the Nazis did was to round up all of the religious and deport them. Took them to Dachau and Auschwitz and executed them. All the, all the religious were taken away. They were all gone. But before they were deported, the Salesians entrusted their work of forming the young people to Jan Tiranowski, a layman, a tailor. But Jan Tiranowski was special because he heard a sermon in which the priest said, you know, it's not difficult to become a saint. It's not difficult to become a saint. Well, Jan Tiranowski hears this and he believes it. He says, this is true. This is true. So he got serious about learning the truths of the Catholic faith. And he got serious about developing a daily personal prayer life. He got serious about the practice of virtue. And guess what? He became a, a living saint. And once the Salesians entrusted their work of forming the young people to Jan, and then they were taken away, he gathered all the young people in the parish into living rosary groups, groups of 15 young people, because back then there were only 15 mysteries of the rosary. Now we have 20. He gathered them together in groups of the living rosary, each group being led by a more mature young person. One of the young people that Jan Tiranowski picked out was Carol Wojtyla. And Tiranowski, this layman, this tailor, formed Carol Wojtyla in the fundamentals of the faith, a deeper life of prayer, the practice of virtue. Really, he was the one who introduced 
John Paul to a deeper life of prayer. One lay person formed one young person and the whole world was changed. One lay person got serious about studying his faith, formed one young person, and the whole world was changed. Anyone remember 1979 when the Pope came to Des Moines, Iowa? Maybe some of you were there. I was living in Iowa at the time, and I can tell you in 1979, the Catholic faith was not very relevant to my life. But all of a sudden, the Pope is coming to Des Moines. The Pope brought Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church to us, and he made it relevant. But not just in Iowa and the United States, he went to 131 different countries. He brought the Catholic faith and the power of Jesus Christ to us. Think of the impact of the World Youth Days. How many millions of young people have had their lives changed because of the World Youth Days? He gives us the first catechism in 400 years. He's instrumental in bringing down the reign of atheistic communism in East Central Europe. And who knows the impact of some of his theological teachings like the theology of the body. One lay person gets serious about studying his faith, forms one young person, and the whole world is changed. Now, I am sure that Jan Taranowski did not set out to change the world. I'm sure he didn't sit back in 1940 and say, I have a plan to change the whole world. What happened? Jan Taranowski encountered the strength and the beauty of Jesus Christ and the Catholic faith, and everything changed. You're not going to go through this series so that you can teach others. You're not going to go through this series so that you can change others. The first and highest reason to study the catechism and the Catholic faith is because it's true and it's beautiful and it's powerful and it will give meaning and purpose to your life and then everything changes. But it will give meaning and purpose to your life because it's the full teaching of Jesus Christ. That's what the catechism is. What is the catechism? Very simply, it's the full teaching of Jesus Christ handed down by the apostles to their successors right to us today. Now one of the things that you're going to learn as you study for the second session of this course is that the Bible is not the full teaching of Jesus Christ. John says in the last line of his gospel that Jesus did many other things that were not written down in this book. But Jesus did give his full teaching to the apostles and they hand it down. Scripture and tradition guided by the teaching authority of the magisterium. That's what we have contained in the catechism. That's why we need to know the catechism. The catechism is the full revelation of Jesus Christ that will set the world ablaze. That's what we're going to study. But we're not just going to study it. We're going to meditate on it. And we're going to live it. And then we change, and then everything changes. Now, the Catechism might seem daunting to you right now before we dive in, but by the end of this study, you will have traveled through and learned the entire Catechism. And that will be a wonderful accomplishment. You will be very satisfied when we're done with this to say, I've been through the whole Catechism. Now, to do this, you're going to need two things. The first thing you'll need is the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I have the old brown 1994 version here, but you may have the newer green version of the Catechism. They're the same. The green version has a few more amenities that I'll explain to you. But even if you have the smaller white uh, handheld version, the smaller version, that's just as good. So whichever version you have, just as long 
as you have a catechism. Now I'm going to show you right now how to use the catechism of the Catholic Church to get the most out of this study. So I want you to open up your catechism, crack it open, break that back in real good so it lays flat. And I want you to open up to the first few pages to the prologue. There's a big heading, bold letters, that says prologue. I want you to open up to that. I want you to get out your pens and your highlighters because I want you to mark up your catechism. You can see mine. There's yellow and red and blue and black and coffee stains and food stains and everything else. I want you to mark this up because there's a secret that many people don't know. At the moment of your death, when you stand before God in your particular judgment, that's what he's going to look for. <laughs> he wants to know whether you've marked up your catechism. You have to present your catechism, and if it's all marked up, you get to go straight in. But if it's not marked up, then you have to go back to purgatory and you have to go through this course again. But you can't do what my teenagers do when they annotate a book over the summer where they just go through and mark things randomly because God knows the difference. And how does he know the difference? Because he can see it in the way you live. He can see it in the way you live. So as we open up to the prologue, from this point on, I will not speak by page numbers, but by paragraph numbers. Because the catechism is all set up by paragraphs, all right? So we jump into paragraph one under the prologue. The purpose of life. That's a great place to start. What's the purpose of life? Why am I here? That's where the catechism starts. Number one, the reason God puts you on the face of this earth is so that you could earn a big salary, live in a big house, and retire early. It's not what the catechism says, is it? No, because there's more to life than this. Number one, God infinitely perfect and blessed in himself in a plan of sheer goodness freely created man to make him share in his own blessed life. Did you catch that? God created you to share in his own divine life. In heaven, God will say, ain't it great to be God? And you will say, yeah, it is great to be God because you will share fully in his life. He put that in you at your baptism. It's starting to unfold. You can't fully see it yet, but it will be fully revealed in heaven. You will live and know and love at the level of God forever. That's why he made you. And that's what this catechism is all about. Learning to live within the fullness of God. But you don't have to wait till heaven. It starts in this life if you just open up to the action of the Holy Spirit. Really what we're talking about is to become fully alive, to reach all of your human potential with God, to become fully alive. Number two, so that this call should resound throughout the world, Christ sent forth the apostles he had chosen, commissioning them to proclaim the gospel. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. All that I have commanded you. The full teaching of Christ. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. So strengthened by this mission, the apostles went forth while the Lord worked with them. And you notice right in the middle of paragraph 3, and I want you to underline this, is a beautiful section. This treasure, the full teaching of Jesus contained in the catechism, this treasure received from the apostles has been faithfully guarded by their successors, the Pope 
and the bishops in union with him, faithfully guarded by their successors and handed on. That's what tradition means. Tradition means to hand on. Jesus gave them his full teaching. They guarded it. They handed it on. We have it in the catechism. We have it in the catechism. Now I want to show you and help you to understand the structure of the catechism. So turn to paragraph 13. You see a bold heading right above that, the structure of the catechism. And you'll notice in paragraph 13, and I want you to underline this, it speaks of the way the catechism is built on four pillars. Four pillars. Those four pillars are the creed, the liturgy and the, and the sacraments, the commandments, and then the life of prayer. But as you turn the page and you look at paragraph 14, right above that you see in bold part one, the profession of faith. Everything that's outlined in the creed that we proclaim on Sunday. Part one walks through the outline of the creed, explaining in detail all the parts of our faith. Right above paragraph 15 you see part two, the sacraments of the faith. This is really beautiful. Everything that Jesus did for us during his life, death, and resurrection, everything that Jesus lived is made present by the power of the Holy Spirit in the liturgy and the sacraments so that what took place in him can take place in us. Remember, we're called to share in the life of God. How does that happen? Because Jesus makes it all present in the liturgy and the sacraments so that we can share in it. So 15, you can underline this. The second part of the catechism explains how God's salvation is made present. All that he did in the past is made present in the sacred actions of the church's liturgy, especially in the sacraments. Then part three above paragraph 16, the life of faith. How the Christian is to live the faith through the virtues and the commandments. And then part four above paragraph 17, prayer in the life of faith. The meaning and the importance of prayer in the life of believers. Catechism is built upon four pillars to believe, to celebrate, to live, and to yearn. To believe, to celebrate, to live, and to yearn. Now I want you to turn the next page and you'll see a picture. There are actually four pictures in this book, so I didn't want you to think that you would have to go through this whole thing and there are no pictures to look at. So at least there are four pictures, one before each part of the catechism. Now I want to show you how to really dig in and use the catechism to your benefit. So I want you to turn back to the table of contents. As you turn to the table of contents, the first thing you see is the prologue. We just covered that. Now I want to show you the four parts in the table of contents. You see, as you go down on the left-hand column, part one, the profession of faith, the creed. And as you see, as we walk down through this, and you turn the page, chapter one, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, the first part of the creed. Then as you keep moving down the page, chapter two, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. On to the next page. Conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. As you keep moving further down, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Keep moving down. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again. Finally, you reach Article 6. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And Article 7, from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. And then finally, chapter 3, I believe in the Holy Spirit. You turn the page again. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. You keep moving down. You see the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Everything to do with the end of life, the end of this world, the second coming of Christ, the resurrection. That's the creed. Everything we believe 
is contained in the creed like a giant oak tree is contained in an acorn. But as we walk through this first pillar, we'll open it up in great detail. Every part. Every part. And that leads us to part two. The celebration of the Christian mystery. Article one, the liturgy. You see under section two, the seven sacraments, and then it begins to walk through each sacrament. Baptism, confirmation, the Eucharist, penance, anointing the sick, holy orders, matrimony. That leads us to part three, life in Christ. How should we live as followers and disciples of Jesus Christ? And that will be built around the desire for happiness and the way that we find happiness through the pursuit of the Beatitudes and the virtues and the living out of the commandments. So the second half of part three is the Ten Commandments, walking through the commandments in detail, which leads us finally to the fourth pillar, Christian prayer. You'll see the headings under Christian prayer, the universal call to prayer, the great Catholic tradition and heritage of prayer. So you turn the page again, the expressions of prayer, vocal prayer, meditation, contemplation, and one we can all relate to, the battle of prayer. The catechism knows, the church knows that we, we have struggles, that it's a battle, and it wants to help us through that battle with very practical advice. And then we will round out our whole study of the catechism in the best way imaginable, by walking through in detail the Our Father, which summarizes the whole of our faith. Now I want to show you the cliff notes. Everyone always wants to know about the cliff notes. Turn to paragraph 44. Paragraph 44. At the end of each section, you have the cliff notes, a summary of what was just covered. You see that? Now I want you to move up to paragraph 508. 508. Because maybe you are interested in knowing what are the top four things that I need to know about the Blessed Virgin Mary. If I had to boil it down, what are the top four things that I need to know? You could go to the end of the section on Mary. gives you four key points on the Blessed Virgin Mary. So now you know where the cliff notes are, but I'm going to take you much deeper than that. Not more complex, but just more deeper. The next thing I want to show you is a very important portion of the Catechism, the biblical footnotes. Go back just a little bit to paragraph 490. Above 490, you see the bold heading, the Immaculate Conception, because this, these four or five paragraphs explain to you the Catholic teaching of the Immaculate Conception. And I want you to notice right in the middle of paragraph 490, it refers to the passage in Scripture, Luke chapter 1, verse 28, where the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and he calls her by a new name, her God-given name, full of grace. You see that right in the middle of 490, full of grace? And it has a footnote, footnote 133. Look to the bottom of the page, 133 tells you Luke, chapter 1, verse 28. Keep your hand there and just start flipping through the catechism. What do you see at the bottom of almost every page? Biblical footnotes. Because the catechism is going to show you that everything the Catholic Church teaches is rooted in Scripture. Everything the Church teaches is found in Scripture. And the catechism does a great job of pointing that out clearly. Now also notice in that paragraph 490, there are numbers in the margin, on the right-hand margin. You've got all these numbers. For example, next to 490, you see 2676. 2676. If you follow the cross-references, you can drill down as far as you can imagine in any topic of the faith. If you follow 490, 
to 2676, the Catechism will teach you that Mary is the Immaculate Conception, that she has this special role in the Catholic faith precisely because of her unique relationship to the Holy Spirit. And then 2676 begins to explain this hidden, deep relationship between Mary and the Holy Spirit. I had a doctoral course on the Trinity in which the professor only used the catechism following the cross-references, where you can drill as far down as you can imagine. It is astounding how well put together the catechism is. You can study it at the level of the in brief. You can read the sections. You can follow the footnotes. You can follow the cross-references, and you can go as deep as you want to go. I think in a thousand years we're going to look back and we're going to say the Catechism is one of the greatest human achievements in the way that this thing is put together. Now I want you to move up to the end of the Catechism, paragraph 2865. Paragraph 26, 2865, the end of the Catechism. On the next page, what do you see? index of citations and underneath that you see it says sacred scripture and right under that Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 through 2 4 right you see that and then it starts walking through every passage of the Bible and next to each scripture passage is a number to a paragraph in the catechism if you have any questions about any passage from the Bible, you go into the Catechism in this section under the Index of Citations. You find your Scripture passage. It sends you to a, a paragraph in the Catechism that then explains that Scripture passage. So I'll tell you the truth. I'm sitting at Mass in my parish, and 1030 Mass, and I know that we're supposed to, with all of our effort, be focused on the Mass, and all of a sudden I found myself realizing we got nothing at home for lunch. And I, I look to the side and I see some friends of ours that live in our neighborhood, and immediately I think, I bet they have something for lunch. So I, I put that aside, but after Mass, I immediately went over and I said, oh, it's great to see you, you know, we ought to get together sometime. And they said, well, why don't you come over for lunch? <laughs> sure. <laughs> love to. So we went over to their house for lunch and I'm telling you the truth we were done with the meal having a cup of coffee and the wife says to me you know I was praying the luminous mysteries and we got to the transfiguration and I just didn't know what to think about. I was just at a complete loss. I, I didn't know what to meditate on during the rosary with the transfiguration. And I said do you have a catechism in the house? Well, yeah we'll go get it. So she went and got the catechism and open it up and I said now go to the back of your catechism and find the scriptural index the index of citations and I said now move forward and find the Gospel of Matthew so I want you to do this now you go through all the books of the Old Testament and then you find you, the New Testament starts with Matthew you keep moving through and I told her Matt, the transfiguration occurs in Matthew chapter 17 verses 1 through 8 so you find Matthew chapter 17, 1 through 8, correct? You see that? And there's a number next to it, 554. So now, go back to that paragraph in the Catechism, paragraph 554. And there you find a foretaste of the kingdom, the transfiguration. And 1, 2, 3, 4, five paragraphs explaining in depth the mystery of the transfiguration and it was so beautiful because she got real quiet she started reading through it finally she looked up at me and she said I get it I get it that's the beauty of the catechism now maybe you don't know where the transfiguration is found. I said, Mike I don't know that it was in Matthew chapter 17 1 through 8 well, there's another way that you can go about this. 
So keep going back to the end of your catechism, past the index of citations, and you find a subject index. You find a subject index. Almost to the end of your catechism, you find a subject index, every subject you can imagine. So you think, well, I know that the transfiguration has something to do with Jesus. At least I can get that far. So I go through the subject index until I find Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And then I start flowing through those columns. I turn the page. Ah, the life of Jesus. Okay, I'm getting closer. And I keep moving through the second column, the transfiguration of Jesus. And it sends you right back to those paragraphs. Right back to those paragraphs. But I want to show you one other thing. Because one of my favorite prayers is the rosary. But we can't let the rosary just be the saying of words. It has to be a meditation, thinking about the life of Jesus so that we take on his life. And the catechism is a wonderful help to this meditation of the rosary. Go back to paragraph 512, and I want to just show you something here. If you turn to paragraph 512, you see the mysteries of Christ's life. Now, I want you to know, whenever we say mystery as Catholics, we don't mean something you can't understand. What would be the point of studying something you can't understand? God reveals these things to us so that we'll understand. When the church says mysteries, the church means events, the events from the life of Christ. And God wants us to understand them and enter into them and imitate them. So as you see here above paragraph 512, the mysteries of the life of Christ, and you start to turn the pages, it's walking through every moment, every event in the life of Christ. Above 525, the Christmas mystery, the mystery of Jesus' infancy, the presentation in the temple, 529, the mysteries of his hidden life, 534, the finding of Jesus in the temple. Above 535, the first luminous mystery, the baptism of Jesus, his temptations. 541, the proclamation of the kingdom of God, and on and on, walking through all the events of the life of Christ. Open up and, and read these as you pray the rosary. Read them out loud to your kids, your grandkids. Paint a picture for them to think about when they're praying the rosary so that we can bear this with us all day long, this life of Christ, all the events from the life of Christ. Now I also want you to notice on the bottom of any page, not only will you see biblical footnotes, references to scripture, but other abbreviations that might confuse you like LG, or SC, or GES. These are not references to the Bible, but to church documents, especially documents from Vatican II. So I want you to go to page 801 of the brown version and 861 of the green version, and there you will see, so 801 of the brown version, 861 of the green version, there you will see abbreviations. And it will explain to you what all those abbreviations are. So, for example, as you go down in alphabetical order and you see LG, that's Lumen Gentium, which was one of the four pillar documents of Vatican II. Because the Catechism wants to expand and explain more clearly all the great teachings of Vatican II. But it doesn't stop with Vatican II. It draws from other church documents that came out before the publication of the Catechism. And all those, the explanations of those abbreviations are right there. Now those of you who have the green version have an added feature, like the DVD player in the back of the headrest. Mine doesn't have that one. Yours has a special, a special little gift, the glossary. So you turn to the back of your green Catechism and you'll see a glossary. 
So let's say I got a question about an indulgence. I don't understand what an indulgence is. So you go in the glossary, you look, and it gives you a definition of an indulgence, but then it gives you a paragraph or a series of paragraph numbers where you can go back and study it. That's Citation on indulgence leads you to 1471, which gives you a whole explanation of how to understand an indulgence. Now you know what's in the catechism, and now you know how to use it. Now you will gain the most if you read a little bit of the catechism each day, answer the questions, and then listen to my explanation as you follow along in the catechism. But I don't want you to feel, oh, more things to do. I know I have homework. Even if you just open up your catechism and just listen to the session, without reading anything, without studying and answering anything, you're going to get a tremendous amount out of this study. So I don't want you to feel pressure that you've got to go through all this homework. We're giving you multiple levels, multiple layers for greater learning, but not required homework. You can do it all, or you can just listen to each session or somewhere in between, and you will learn a tremendous amount. But I'll tell you, if you would read a little bit of the Catechism each day, one paragraph each day, spend some time in silence thinking about it, and then just keep in mind what you read through the day. This remembrance will change the way you think and the way you act. And it will start to train you to go deeper in prayer and meditation because the catechism is the full revelation of Jesus. And to spend time thinking about what Jesus taught us and to remember what he taught us will change the way we think and that will change the way we act. And then everything changes. Let me just show you one little snippet that you'll study this coming week. As you look at paragraph 30, and you can see very quickly that there, are, there is much to meditate on in the Catechism. Paragraph 30 speaks of the fact that Often we forget about God, but God never forgets about us. And no matter how far we stray, He's always pursuing us, and He's always right there. And He is the fulfillment of our heart's desire. And then the Catechism gives you this beautiful quote from St. Augustine from his Confessions, and that indented portion under paragraph 30, the last line, you yourself encourage him to delight in your praise, for you have made us for yourself, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. My heart is restless until I ultimately rest in God. What if I would just keep that in mind the rest of today? I'd be more at peace. Well, I hope that you feel that the Catechism is a little less daunting now. And I hope that you are really excited to journey through this pilgrimage. Because when we finish this, you are going to sit back and you are going to say, Wow, I am really glad the church gave us the Catechism. All of my confusion is dispelled. So until next time, Eat this large thing little by little, bite by bite. Chew on it, meditate on it, keep it in mind, let it change the way you live. Thank you for being with us.